You're listening to the Pentaract Poetry Podcast, hosted by Anthony Etherin. Welcome to episode 17 of the Pentaract Poetry Podcast. My guest this time is Ken Hunt, author of The Lost Cosmonauts, The Odyssey, and The Manhattan Project. I met up with Ken a few weeks ago to discuss the relationship between science and poetry. I began by asking what inspired him to become a poet. I can safely say I started writing poetry when I was 12 or 13. I remember there was a weird moment when I just thought, I want to write a poem. And it sounds uh, contrived, but I, I, I had this weird impulse to just try it out. And I remember uh, being really excited when I, when I first started to write uh, poetry specifically, because I, I, I dabbled in writing prose uh, when I was even younger than that. Um, but it never really went anywhere, and it, it hasn't really gone anywhere since. I, I've just recently started getting back into prose, but but poetry seemed to click just naturally for whatever reason. Um, and I think I can attribute that in part to the fact that uh, both my parents read to me uh, from a time when I was very young, and they uh, read a lot of poetry to me. It was mostly children's poetry, but, but some of it wasn't. And again, both my parents would read to me my... my um, my mom and dad had a, a huge library of books that they'd read as children, so I got a lot of exposure to literature from a really young age. And uh, again, I, when I was 12 or 13, I just started writing. And um, I had uh, several unsuccessful attempts to, uh, to uh, woo members of the opposite sex when I was in my teens with, with poetry, which in uh, you know, the, the early 2000s is not a... Um, not uh, not a smart way to go about uh, <laughs> to go about courtship. It's it's not exactly uh, the the socially accepted and and uh, normative way to do that. And nevertheless, I, I tried. Um, and uh, even though that uh, didn't work, I found myself still wanting to write poems. I, I just enjoyed the process of it, so I kept going. And um, there was a moment in my undergrad at uh, the University of Calgary in Alberta where I discovered Crystallography, which is Christian's uh, first major poetic publication. I remember I found it in the, uh, the university's bookstore, and I read a few pages of it, and I immediately bought it, and then I went to the sort of common area of that building and sat on a couch and spent about an hour reading the entire thing, um, which was a very singular experience for me, and it, it was... I don't think it's happened again with the book, um, <clears throat> and it it was it wasn't necessarily a moment that um, made me want to write poetry because I was already writing it. But it was it was I think definitely the moment when I uh, the moment when I realized okay I can I can do this as part of my actual career. Like this can be something that I do uh, that that works academically. I can I can find a way to make. Uh, poetry part of my university career because at that time when I was doing my undergrad I was in I was in uh, archaeology actually I started out uh, uh, in archaeology and I was taking a lot of anthropology courses as well and history courses and I ended up doing a history degree uh, eventually uh, but I I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do I didn't have the kind of confidence in pursuing uh, literature or even the study of literature as a as a, a a career path academically. So that book, reading that book, was really a, a turning point. And since then, I've I've essentially been following whatever uh, uh, paths of inspiration open themselves up and and trying to commit to them as best I can. So yeah, well, we get another mention on the podcast for for Christian Book, who seems to be mentioned in every episode. Uh, I started this podcast to fuel my ego, not his. <laughs> well, I, I have no doubt so, if, I'd, if I'd known you at the time, I probably would be would be emulating your work as well. Um, it's it's a consequence of just where I was at in my life, I think, that I, I ran into his work. And also the fact that he was teaching at UFC at the time. That that was really strange, to read that book and then to realize after the fact that this guy's actually right here physically at this university. That was, that was again, I, I sort of scrambled to... Um, find a way to to take his his class after that so. yeah 
So it, it changed your attitude towards poetry. I mean, it, it must have also changed the nature of your poetry. If you say you start, you know, when you started out, it was love poems, yeah. albeit unsuccessful ones. I mean, that must have led to uh, generally working with lyrical poetry, which is, I think, what most teenagers do anyways, lyrical or political. Uh, so mm. was it crystallography that made you think about more form based and objective poetry? Absolutely, it was. Um, I think the, the lyric um, nature of, of the earliest poetry that I was writing or attempting to write uh, has has managed to survive uh, in some form. But uh, again, yeah, form is the key word. I think reading crystallography was part of my introduction to experimentation with form in poetry. Um, and I can also, I have to give credit where credit is due as well to other instructors at U of C besides Christian. Um, at least at the time, a lot of these professors have actually left uh, U of C since, which is a which is a shame. Um, but there were several at, uh, at that institution at the time I was there that that were very instrumental uh, in introducing me to different forms of poetry. Robert Majels is one of them, and he's no longer, uh, as far as I know, working uh, in in the academy. But uh, he's a terrific poet. He's a translator of poetry as well. Uh, he translates a lot of um, French Canadian poetry into English. Uh, in collaboration with other poets and at the time he was at uh, U of C and I, I was lucky enough to take uh, his second year undergrad poetry class in which I was introduced to the process of erasure and I had no uh, prior experience with that process and um, it was in his class that I actually came up with the idea for uh, one of my books The Odyssey. Um, so how, how long I, ago was this? Oh this would have been about 2012, so about eight years ago, almost nine years ago, uh, where I came up with that idea and I actually started working on it. And it was the uh, <clears throat> it was the the very rough first few pages of that erasure that I used to apply to take Christian's um, manuscript course, which was a, a upper level undergrad course. And all the all the creative writing classes at UFC, and I, I, as far as I know, this is still the, the case today. You have to apply uh, for them using a um, a package of uh, of creative work that you actually submit prior to being accepted. You have to be evaluated for your potential um, uh, for creative writing before you can be admitted to these classes. And uh, again, the the work that I did in Roberts class was uh, was what got me into Christian's course. So I owe a lot to him um, as an instructor. And he was he was really unique <clears throat> uh, as a as a like pedagogically. He was very unique. Um, I don't think I've ever had a professor quite like Robert Majels ever since. He was very enigmatic and and open to involving students in the structure of the class in a very um, fundamental way, despite the fact that we were just undergrads. Uh, he, he treated us more like graduate students, which I think benefited all of us just by by allowing us freedom to make suggestions that we probably wouldn't have made, um, despite having thought of them. We, we probably would have kept our mouths shut, um, like undergrads are supposed to do. So, But it's obviously inspired you to, to uh, become an academic and follow that path yourself. Yes, that too. Um, and, and as I said, yeah, there, there are a lot of fantastic um, professors at U of C. Uh, Aretha Van Herk is still there. And uh, I took, I believe, two courses with her, at least one. Uh, and you never forget a class with Aretha Van Herk. She is, she is, uh, she's fiery. She is, uh, she is very tense and uh, very blunt with her criticism in the best possible way, uh, where <clears throat> where uh, being blunt for other professors can be a fault. Uh, for her, it's it's an incredible strength because she will flat out tell you right away in honest, direct language what's wrong with your work. And as long as you can, uh, you know, develop a, 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 a thick skin to that, if you if you haven't already, um, she'll help you do that, which is another benefit. But um, your writing will improve immensely. <clears throat> and the courses I took with her were, were prose classes. And again, I, I don't write much prose, but it's, it's beneficial 
and it uh, it was beneficial for me to um, understand when I was writing uh, prosaically what what the weaknesses were in my prose. And so in the future, when I started to write more prose poetry, um, I was able to use that that uh, experience. So again, uh, her her tutelage is very important to me as a, a poet and as an academic to um, and Suzette Meyer as well. She's another uh, uh, professor who I don't know if she's still at UFC. Um, she took a leave of absence around the time I graduated um, from UFC. So I'm not sure if she's still there. I think she is. But uh, she's another uh, uh, excellent instructor and excellent writer as well. Uh, her prose is, is very poetic. And she actually started out as a poet. And she would remind us of this in her, cor in her course. Uh, and she would say, you know, if you're poetically inclined and you're in this course for whatever reason, uh, you can transition to prose. It's not impossible. And that's something that I've I've thought about since then in my sort of more recent attempts to to move potentially into writing some prose. This is fascinating to me because I, I didn't study creative writing academically. I, my, my degree is in physics. So I have a couple of questions about this. Sure. What happens when you're given contradictory advice by your tutors? You've got one tutor saying one thing or one class saying one thing and uh, another class contradicting it. How do you cope with that? Or does it not happen as much as I suspect it would? It does happen. And I, I guess the best way I can describe it, uh, especially to someone who's, who's a physics uh, major, would be to say that there's different theories. Uh, there's, there's sort of string theory and, and, and whatnot, and they're not... Uh, they're not proven 100%, but they're compelling theories. And when you follow them, they have a tendency to make you think in a different way and and potentially reveal information to you that you wouldn't have encountered, I, I guess, uh, unless you were following the, the logic of that theory. So um, there's, I mean, in terms of mechanical ways to improve your writing, sort of the, the ways to alter your process or to modify it, to improve your work. I mean, Robert, his, his method of teaching was more so just to expose us to as many different forms of writing as, as he could in the allotted time of the course. And that's probably a strategy that um, specifically works better with, uh, with younger students or, or with, uh, <clears throat> with undergrads. Um, but again, I mean, when I was even in my my graduate degree, I've I've discovered methods of writing that I had no idea existed before. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's that's one strategy, I guess, is is to simply show your students an array of different processes and then see which ones they gravitate to naturally. So that's sort of one way of teasing out um, whatever natural inclinations um, your students might have without knowing it. And I think that's that's really one of the most valuable. Um, methods of of improving someone's process is to just show them an array of things. Maybe they know five out of ten of of the different um, procedures that you've shown them, but there's going to be at least one that they haven't discovered, and it's beneficial to experiment with that, even if it fails, even if it's not something that sticks. Uh, in terms of of um, tips for for writing prose better. Um, it's it's a completely different animal. There's a lot more benefit, I think, from workshopping when it comes to prose. I think because it's so much more dependent on narrative, whereas a lot of the time poetry is dependent on uh, form and and the uh, as I said the experimentation process. And a lot of that is is solitary or or it. I guess you can get away with being solitary, <laughs> whereas with with prose. Um, I at least personally found it more beneficial to to be critiqued, whereas when I was on my own trying to write prose, I, I kind of felt lost in the woods. But that's not really my medium, so that that's probably a personal um, perspective uh, uh, issue. But uh, I would say that uh, contradictory advice was your question. I'm trying to I'm trying to gravitate back to that. I don't think I've ever received contradictory advice. I don't think I've ever. I can't think of two two. Um, pieces of advice or methods or aphorisms or anything that that have directly contradicted each other. It, I think there's alternate methods and you can usually only do one at a time. So it's hard to it's hard to uh, encounter a, a contradiction 
Uh, at least I, I don't think I have. If I have, maybe I just forgot it <laughs> because it wasn't <laughs> useful to remember it. But <laughs> I, I suppose that's my best attempt at answering your question. No, it's good. It's interesting. And and you you mentioned, well, you hinted at your knowledge of science there with that analogy you started with. And this, of course, is such a big part of your writing now. Your last three books have all had a scientific edge. Well, they are science inspired poetry books. And it was interesting when you, because I didn't know that you studied archaeology and have a degree in history. And that, but that kind of makes sense to me that you have an objective view of the world and that comes into your poetry quite a lot. When did you become interested in science? Oh, at a very young age. Um, I, I come from a family of, um, of uh, engineers and scientists. My, uh, my uncle is a, a physicist uh, and my dad is a, uh, a civil engineer. And he, uh, he runs a company, in addition to teaching, he has a company that uh, essentially does consulting work. And the, the company's uh, claim to fame is a computer model of uh, how traffic moves through urban areas. And essentially urban planners will use this, this model as a tool to predict uh, how traffic will move and change based on different policy decisions and different um, different construction projects or actions. Uh, and it's been used all over the world. There are different cities uh, all over the place that have used this this computer model. So my dad is kind of involved in in the um, conceptual mathematical side of that uh, that project. And then he's he's over the years. Uh, partnered up with um, colleagues and former grad students to to develop this this model. So that's that's uh, the the uh, sort of um, paternal uh, figure that I grew up with. And then of course his brother being a physicist and uh, really the my dad's whole side of the of the of the family uh, is full of engineers and uh, and very sort of as you said um, uh, objectively minded uh, people. A huge emphasis on academic um, pursuits as well, uh, which I am grateful for because it's it's given me a, a means of um, structuring my impulse to write uh, poetry and and to write other in other forms, uh, which has been tremendously helpful. It, it it benefits to have some kind of um, container to pour that that magma into and have it solidify into a shape of some kind, right? Um, and in terms of, uh, of history, my mother is a, is a huge uh, lover of, of history. And she, I think, played a part in instilling in me an appreciation for, um, for uh, history in general. Um, she used to uh, write for uh, various blogs in the late 90s that were sort of historically inflected. Um, before blogs were really a mainstream thing, uh, both my parents, uh, I should I should note, uh, have uh, master's degrees, or or uh, in my, my dad's case, he has a PhD from Cambridge, and I think it was sort of inevitable that I would end up at university um, studying something, and I think initially going into archaeology was probably a consequence of 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 uh, my my interest in history and also just uh my interest in i mean every i don't i don't know of a, a a childhood friend that i have that i've that i've had that didn't love uh digging for treasure you know imagining that you can unearth some artifact you know some ark of the covenant in your backyard right and so i i was i was a uh, uh, i was always digging holes as a kid uh on the playground or you know at home so i think going into archaeology was probably some vain attempt to <laughs> to um, turn that process into a, into a career. But then you, you go into archaeology and you realize how tedious the excavation process is. And I think it was, again, it's ironic, but for somebody who writes um, very uh, structured poetry, even, the pro even that process was too tedious for me. I, I, couldn't, uh, I, couldn't, um, uh, I couldn't stand it, frankly. It's, it's, it's extremely grueling, the, the process of unearthing anything because of course you're trying not to destroy what you're <laughs> what you're excavating so i think that that sort of turned me off of archaeology but um yeah the the in terms of just my interest in science in general growing up in that kind of a family 
uh, you know, I, I was receiving science uh, books every year for Christmas and, and astronomy, you know, kids guide to astronomy, that sort of thing. And, and um, you know, model. Uh, my uncle was a, a big uh, science uh, uh, nerd, so he would he would give me gifts like a, I have a somewhere in the basement of my parents house is a, a fairly large Starship Enterprise from the next generation with lights and sounds and all sorts of things. And, you know, I, I grew up sleeping under a blanket with astronauts and planets on it. And I had the I had the glowing star on my ceiling, you know, those those uh, those uh, 90s glow in the dark uh, stars and planets that you could stick on the wall. So I, I guess and of course, the 90s was the era of the space race as well. So I was kind of inundated with all this this imagery and iconography and and you know, coming from that sort of family. So I think it was inevitable that I I would at least be attracted to it in some form. And um, pairing it with poetry, I think, came about just after I I abandoned um, poetry as a means of courtship. And but I still wanted to write it. So but the problem is, of course, what do you write about? Right. Yeah. And that was really the the subject that just came up in my in my mind as the most obvious candidate, especially after encountering crystallography, is I realized, OK, poetry can be this and it can be about this. And in fact, I want it to be about this. So I hope that uh, hope that answers your question. Yeah, it's remarkable. Um, my father was a scientist. My mother was interested in history. I wanted she actually <laughs> wanted me to be an archaeologist. Yeah, <laughs> and my father went to Cambridge, so oh, that's fast. That's fascinating. <laughs> the coincidences. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. How, I mean, how do you feel then about the position of what you and I have in the past have called extrospective poetry as opposed to introspective? It, this is itself a, a sort of overused metaphor, but it's it rings true um, because writing. Um, has yet to effectively respond, at least on mass, to um, various uh, digital tools that have popped up that can create uh, extrospective writing very well, uh, as well as a human almost. And I think a lot of people would say better than a human being at this point. Uh, writing has entered a similar problem that painting uh, encountered in uh, at the turn of the uh, 20th century, where you have cameras that are able to reproduce a landscape perfectly. And so how do you respond to that as a realist painter? Well, you have to invent cubism. You have to invent impressionism. You have to differentiate your human uh, work from the work of the camera. Now, ironically, of course, now we have digital tools that can produce impressionist paintings and cubist paintings. So how do you respond to that? And it's like, well, some artists are saying, well, I'm going to respond by showing you a blank canvas because yes, a machine can do that, but why would it? Right? So there's, there's, there's an effort to sort of writhe or wriggle away from, from the, the implied constraint or the imposed constraint of, uh, of essentially artificially created art. And I think, the problem with extrospective writing in 2020 would be that it's so easy for a machine to do that kind of work. And it's even easy for a machine to do the kind of work that I do. So there's an anxiety, I think, that that's looking for an outlet. And there's a lot of, I think the majority of artists, honestly, are just ignoring it. They're just saying, I'm just going to do this anyway. Which is fine. I mean, that's a fine response if, if you can do it so well that your work again stands out. As long as it stands out for any reason. Um, I was going to say, yeah, there's uh, there's hyper realism now in the visual arts. So you're basically trying to keep up. You're trying to show that you're as good as the technology now. The yeah, technology it's, it's, has taken over. So you've got to be able to say, look, I can paint. I can do a painting that's as good as a photograph. Yeah, it's almost a new standard and it's it's a different kind of pressure. I mean, you're you're the Renaissance atelier to a computer. Like you're the you're the uh, you know, you're 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 paint you're you're the paint by numbers uh, student forever. Like it's kind of a, it's kind of a hell. Like you're you're you know, the computer gives you a paint by numbers and okay, how how well can you stay within the lines? I mean, that's that's definitely I think a feeling a lot of artists have and a lot of writers. 
uh, is, is just, we're just trying to keep up, keep pace um, with algorithmic uh, art, which is frightening. Uh, if, if you do any kind of um, research into this, and even just a quick Google search of, of anything, you know, the Portrait AI website is fascinating, something I discovered a few months back, where you can put a photograph into it, and it will portraitize that photograph as if it were painted by a Dutch master. And a lot of the time, again, the algorithm's not perfect yet, not yet, but a lot of the time you'll put in a picture of yourself or of some random person, and it comes out looking like uh, a, a, a painting by, a, by a, one of the masters, and it's, it's almost perfect, and it's, it's frightening how, um, how sophisticated that little tool is. And a lot of it You'll is. You have to I send think, me the link to this. <laughs> you've never seen Portrait AI? Okay, let me let me uh, let me drop this in the chat for you here. So there's there's a couple of examples on the on the front page here. Uh, it's mostly politicians and celebrities that have that have been put into this. There's a lot of uh, Mark Zuckerberg's and uh, <laughs> Donald Trumps and various things. But uh, if you just check out this website, this is one of these tools, <clears throat> and it's it's an algorithmic um, you know algorithmic tool. And it, it creates art out of photographs. So there's a there's a there's a PhD thesis to be written about these tools that hasn't been written yet um, about the implications for art. Because here you have already photographs, right? And the implications yeah. of the photograph as a as an intrusion upon realist art. And then you have the response to that being impressionism and cubism. And then you have the AI saying, Oh, I can do that too. I can do it better than you can. So what can't it do? And what, uh, what different forms are about to be sort of subsumed by the, this, this, these, uh, these algorithmic amoebas absorbed to the point where, again, as, as you were saying earlier, we now as artists, as human artists, we're, we're not uh, producing innovation. We are scrambling to keep up. And I think Every artist is in the same position. Painters aren't ahead of writers anymore. We're all at the same point now. We've all been leveled by just being slammed into the ground um, by the advent of these tools. And again, whether you're aware of them or not, your work is in a milieu where it will be compared to them. So if you try to ignore it as an artist, and, and as we were talking about extrospective work, uh, producing ext extrospective work, again, is not... Uh, necessarily a bad strategy the work will not necessarily be inferior but keep in mind it will be compared to this kind of uh, art that is produced not by a uh, human but by by an algorithm um, so it's 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 a strange time to be an artist it's a very strange time to to be producing any kind of art we'll have to when we send this po podcast out we'll have to have portraits of me and you side by side <laughs> i think so <laughs> that's that's perfect yeah uh, but, well, okay, given the, the difficulties of trying to create the sort of poetry we do in this age, let's talk a bit about method. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, how how science can be used as in, inspiration for poetry. I was thinking about this earlier. I think you've got really three ways because you could simply write a poem about science, which uh, you've done, pl you've done plenty of over the last few years. You know, people tell me I'm prolific. And I, and I say to him, no, you look, look at Ken Hunt. He's got <laughs> three <laughs> books in three years, all substantial works. So that's one way. And then another way is to have science or mathematics actually inspire how something is written. Okay. So my, my alien drones, for example, or uh, you know, uh, the Xenotext, the actual biology is telling Christian how to write the poem. And then I think, yeah, in between that, and, and I suppose this could apply to most types of poetry, you've got the, the way that subject determines form. So to say one, one of your examples, a, a poem we published of yours a couple of years ago uh, from, and it's in your uh, latest book, Manhattan Project, is Clear Skies, which is an erasure poem about an, an atomic bomb going off. So you've got the starkness and desolation they're married with the form of an erasure. Uh, have I missed anything? Are there any other ways that science and poetry can be united? I, I don't think so. I think the, the experimentational or experimentative, however you would put it, um, 
the, the spirit of experimentation certainly is is present in, in poetry. There's an exuberance about experimentation um, that I think poetry and, and science as as ways of of creating um, or ways of investigating investigating the senses, I guess you could say. They, they share this this exuberance about ex, about the experimentation. Um, I think fundamentally that might be the most important thing they share. Uh, because in, in poetry, you, you do have the poem itself seems to be excited that it exists. The best poems are excited that they exist. You know, Ode on a Grecian Urn, for example, is a poem that I, I read when I was very young. Uh, it's a poem my, my mother read to me, one of her favorite poems, and in consequence, one of mine. And it seems to be as, as melancholic as it, as it can get. It seems to be excited that it exists. It seems to almost be aware of itself. And I think the best science has that quality to it where an experiment or a paper an article about uh, a series of experiments or, or some kind of investigation into some some idea if if it if it takes off if it has traction if if it attracts people to it if it causes other people to be inspired to repeat the experiment it it seems to have to be excited that it exists and it's it's almost like a, a a little homunculi of ideas that that is it's not but it's the opposite of, of something like Frankenstein's monster. It, it's it's happy that it, it was created. It's actually grateful to exist. It's more than grateful. It's exuberant. So I think fundamentally poetry and science share that quality. At least the the most effective poetry and the most effective science. Um, but as you were saying, the three different forms of of science inspired poetry. I think that's absolutely spot on. I think there's science poetry that focuses on uh, a formal imitation of science. There's science poetry that discusses scientific ideas and focuses more on the ideas than on uh, a formal um, imitation uh, of them. And I think there is science poetry. In my opinion, the best is, is the poetry that tries to do both uh, to some degree, because then you have the best of both worlds in the best case. Uh, but you can also end up with the worst of both if it's it's a bad poem <laughs> so it's a, it's, also, it's a gamble <laughs> well it is a gamble yeah it's, it's the rarest because it's, it's <clears> one that tends to involve some level of funding to get you going <laughs> that's right that's right the xenotext is not a cheap uh it's not a cheap book to produce part part one was not and and um, certainly part two won't be i which i i hope uh uh once the world uh settles down here we, i hope we can see part two soon that's something i'm i'm waiting for as well so yeah definitely so that's that's how science inspires us. Do you think that it, it goes the other way? Do you think that uh, valuable works of art inspire science? Uh, absolutely. I think I think it happens more often than we are aware that it's happened because, ironically, scientists. I mean, there's a, there's a quote from somebody. I don't remember who. Uh, the the quotation or the aphorism basically says scientists are just like normal people or like children who who play. And the only difference is they record it. They they have a journal or a, and that science is the, is the act of you can almost reduce it to just the act of self observation. Like you're you're recording all your actions and then reflecting on them. There's a there's an element of self reflection. And again, that's another quality that poetry and science shares is, is this sense of self reflection. Um, fundamentally, I think you can't have poetry without self reflection, and of course you can't have science without it either. Um, but when it comes to art inspiring science, the irony I'm referring to is that while scientists are, are famous for meticulously recording their actions in order to weed out biases and to, to refine whatever experiment they're doing, they often will not record their inspiration for doing the experiment in the first place. Like if they heard a line of poetry or heard a, a, a piece of music or something that gave them the idea in the first place. I think a lot of the time that gets lost in the shuffle, in the in the eagerness to to begin the experiment, um, and poets are guilty of this too. I mean, if if you don't uh, keep track of what your inspirations are, oftentimes you'll you'll either be put on the spot when you're asked, or you know you'll at, at the very worst you'll be accused of some kind of plagiarism because you you haven't uh, you haven't cited your sources effectively uh, as a poet. <clears throat> and um, I do think that that there are instances of this that we will never know about. There are probably 
scientific breakthroughs that we encounter every day in our lives, uh, objects that we use every day, exist as a result of them, and we will never know that that poet read E.E. E. Cummings or yeah. John Keats or some you know, passage from Wordsworth, and that's what made them you know, invent that material or perform that experiment. I don't, and I, I, again, I think it's more common. I don't think it's, it's super common or, or that it's, you know, every scientist was informed by some piece of art. I don't think that's true, but I do think that it's more common than we know. And I think that it, it would be, it's a shame that it's not admitted because uh, poetry certainly does um, refer to science quite a bit. I mean, this goes back all the way to Aristotle and, and Plato's discussions of, of the merits of poetry. I mean, Aristotle uh, uses biological metaphors all the time in his writing. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a relationship that seems to be um, very deeply... Uh, these, these two fields have informed each other for a long time. And uh, I, I'm surprised, in fact, that there's not more discussion about it because this, the more I read about it, the more examples of it that I find. Even just studying for these, these PhD um, qualification exams that I recently wrote, uh, I, was, I was amazed by how many uh, literary critics and philosophers were, they weren't just using scientific metaphors to describe their theories. They were actually saying, no, this, this theory is a science or it wants to be a science. And it's not just informed by science, it actually is a science. And we need to treat literary criticism as a science, we need to give it the same uh, type of um, investigative uh, rigor or the license to be investigative. So it's it's amazing that there's not more writing about this, which is again why I'm I'm hoping to write my thesis about it. I'm hoping to write a book of essays that um, that uh, will discuss different types of science poetry, different eras of it, and, and how they've how they've married the two concepts and how they've. Uh, how they've participated in that discussion, which has been going on for so long. Yeah. Metaphor seems to be the, the big thing where, where you could say that artistic thinking does affect science. Because certainly, and, and Gary Barwin and I talked about this on the podcast that he was on, mm. the more complicated the mathematics of physics gets and the more complicated the world seems to be, the more metaphors you need. And in fact, you now have to have metaphors on top of metaphors on top of metaphors. Yeah, it's hard not to mix metaphors. I, I, that's actually one piece of criticism I, I received uh, in my undergrad. I, I think I do agree. I think a lot of the time you, you don't have to mix metaphors necessarily, but you definitely have to use more than one. Uh, you, it seems like you need a, a small, uh, you know, a, a triumvirate of metaphors, depending on how complex the issue is that you're discussing, for sure. And I, I think that's where form can come in, though, and kind of carry some of that weight. Like if we were discussing different types of science poetry, I think if, if you have a poem that uses a single metaphor, but then its form, uh, and you brought up clear skies, its form, the form of the poem itself is, is itself a, an extended metaphor. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a nonverbal, nonverbal metaphor. Um, maybe that can then carry some of that, that necessary weight. These poems that try to do both, that try to uh, discuss science within the language itself and also outside of it uh, with, with the form of the actual poem. Um, that's why they're so effective is again, they take some pressure off of the language because there's so much pressure now on, on language itself to, to perform perhaps beyond its ability to, to perform. I mean, we're, we're really seeing, and this has been the case. I mean, you, you know, the conceptualists uh, would argue that it's been the case since, you know, the early nineties, late eighties and the, Every, every generation of, of writers has, has said, we're really at the limits now. We, language can't stretch any further than this. And it's like, well, it's pretty pliable. It's, it's, it's stretching. But then, you know, you come to 2020 and it's like, well, there's, there's language versions of the Portrait AI app that I linked to. And there's, there's hundreds of them. <laughs> and there's going to be more. Um, and they only, they only keep getting better. So the, the anxiety, I think, is not going to go away. Uh, so I think, I think doing more than one thing with language, you know, controlling and mediating not just the language itself and not just the language and the form of the poem, but also the, the, the typography, the layout of your book, the, all, all those choices. And this is something that I, I sort of naively thought that I could 
be involved in with uh, the Lost Cosmonauts, <clears throat> where I was very, I was very um, adamant about uh, controlling every aspect of the design, even though I I didn't have the experience necessarily to do that. Um, and I, I was confident that I'd taught myself enough not to make uh, too many mistakes, or hopefully not to make any mistakes. But uh, if, you, if you look at that book, I'm, I'm still quite proud of that book. I think it turned out very well. But the font size is incorrect. It's, it's, a, it's a blatant mistake. And it's my mistake, not the designers at uh, BookHug and not the printer. Uh, it's actually a mistake I made when I was designing the book uh, in Adobe InDesign. I was looking at it on a 4K screen, and this is, um, you could, again, this is something you could write a whole essay about, the, the, uh, the difference between viewing something digitally and viewing it physically. Uh, oh, yeah. Is, there's so many pits you can fall into. Uh, and I was, you know, I was zoomed in at different levels. I was concerned with other aspects of the design to the point where I didn't realize that the font was too small. Like, <laughs> it's like it was seeing the forest for the trees, right? It's the simplest, most obvious mistake I could possibly have made. Um, and again, it hasn't. It doesn't necessarily ruin the book, but it it uh, it's a it's a flaw that uh, I hope uh, if if there is ever a second printing, the the book can be redesigned. Yeah, I, I think there's there's a problem with trying to juggle. My point I'm trying to make is there's a problem as a as a poet or an artist of any kind when you're trying to juggle all these different concerns. Uh, you can easily you can easily either either. Uh, become a jack of all trades and a master of none or you can you can uh you can give into hubris and you know imagine that you're juggling things that you've already dropped right so it's yeah it's it's tough i mean you you have to and again it's it's a it's a you know i, I was very young when i had my first book published precocious and it's the the fallout of that is you have to be more vigilant about your your own ego, and uh, that's something that, again, it's the the Icarus uh, fable comes to mind, right? You you can't uh, yeah. you can't uh, rely on the on your uh, your wings not to melt. So yeah, you have to you have to know your strengths and, and play to your strengths, and and certainly know your limitations. I think, and it's true it's true that when you're younger, you don't you, you just you think I'm going to have a go at this, and it's I'm going to be brilliant at, at this. I've yeah, never I'll, done it before, I'll, but I'm, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. And then as you get older, you realize, no, hang on. I better stay in my box here. I'm good at this stuff. I'm not so good at this other stuff. Exactly. So, yeah, I, I left the uh, the design of um, of Manhattan Project up to uh, UFC, and they did a phenomenal job, a far better job than I would have done. <laughs> so that was kind of a, a wake-up call as well to, to see how, how fantastic that book turned out. Um, it really is a very good production on all levels. It's not just the formatting; it's the oh, the, the everything. The the, yeah, the quality of the paper, the, the the cover art is fantastic. The I mean that that book is really it's 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 kind of incredible. Um, I'm I'm really grateful to everybody at UFC who who contributed to that. Um, and uh, Helen Helen Hanoski as well. Uh, I, I should I should mention uh, the editing process of that book was by far the most difficult out of the three books that I've published. Uh, the, to, the editing of that book was kind of a nightmare and not, not for any, not for any uh, uh, editorial uh, incompetence or anything like that. It was, it was my own struggle to, to uh, refine those poems because that book was submitted for publication in a much rougher state than the first two. And it took a lot more effort on Helen's part, and I have her to thank for this. She she went through the, those poems with a fine tooth comb, and suggested edits that I never would have imagined. And uh, really, like I, in terms of like all the editorial experiences I've had over the years, that was it was the hardest, but also the best. And those poems are are as good as they are because of Helen Hanoski. And uh, uh, again, I'm just very grateful for that. So again, it's a it's an example of yeah, not not trying to do everything yourself. I mean, it's tempting, and in some cases, depending on what the content is, 
it it's beneficial. I mean, the the Lost Cosmonauts, the the problems with that book during the editing process that came up were mostly uh, formatting and um, there were permission issues with with images from uh, Manhattan Project, but there were a lot of permission issues with Lost Cosmonauts that came up and a lot of um, formatting problems. But but the the poems themselves, I had spent a, an inordinate amount of time editing, and they they were. They were almost all of them written under some kind of constraint. And that, I think, as a poet, helps you when you're editing your own work to have a constraint. I think that's that's sort of takes the takes the editorial uh, rigor and, and outsources it to a to a form. Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of my own work is quite oh, yeah. unedictable, really. <laughs> yeah. I think I was setting you, up, the... setting you up for that. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the process of writing is itself editorial. <clears throat> That's the thing. It's, you're editing from the start, from the moment yes. you start writing with them. Absolutely. And I, I think, but I, and again, I, I, just to say, just to finish what I was saying, that the <clears throat> the poems from uh, Lost Cosmonauts, uh, they didn't require as much editorial intervention when it came to the actual text. It was it was other aspects of the book, uh, which was which was great. I mean, that it, it's not to say the reason I bring that up is I, I'm not saying you know oh if you're a poet just let your editor do everything. It's like no make your effort to make your poems the best they can be on your own, but know when to, to stop. I mean, at the time I submitted Lost Cosmonauts, I looked at that book and I thought, I can't do any, any more editing. I don't know what to do. And it's, it's, not, it's not like, oh, there's things I can think of that need to be done, but I don't have the effort. It's like, no, the point where you stop is the point where you're like, I don't know what to do, but I have a sense there is editing left. And I was at that point with um, the Manhattan Project. But it turned out, and you never know this till the editing process begins. It turned out there was a ton of editing that needed to be done to that book, and it and I I had a sort of a suspicion when I submitted it uh, that this is not going to be like the last two books. This one's going to require it's a different beast. It's going to require a different process, and it did. And part of the reason is I I I relaxed a lot of my impulses to apply constraints to that book. There are fewer formal constraints. Uh, in Manhattan Project relative to Lost Cosmonauts. And I think part of that was uh, a consequence of writing about a subject that was, I think, better suited to prose poetry in a lot of ways than formal constraints. It seemed that way anyway to me. The, the narratives uh, of, of these nuclear events and disasters seemed to be more... Um, it, prose just prose poetry seemed to fit them better, and I didn't feel like applying the constraints. Maybe I was just tired from Lost Cosmonauts. I didn't want to do that again, write the same book again. But I think the the format or the form of that book uh, it just necessitated a lot more uh, line edits. Um, but again, uh, it, it turned out fantastic in the end. And again, I'm I'm grateful to everybody who contributed to that. Yeah, it's an amazing book. All three of the, the three books you put out in the, over the last three years are amazing. You, you have the you. Lost Cosmonauts is the first, and now this is the third. In between, then, you, you've got the Odyssey, which is, of course, you've said earlier, you started, you had the idea for it in about 2012. Yeah, that's so the earliest that's, book. Yeah. That's the labor of love, and that, that's this huge erasure project. Uh, did, it, did it drive you mad at any point, having, having to do all, all of that? Oh, I think I, I think my parents thought I was nuts for a while. I I, I would uh, at the time I was I uh, started writing it. I was still living at home, and I was uh, I I printed out the entire two hundred forty six page document, and I had different um, colors of highlighters and pens and pencils, every kind of tool imaginable, scrawling all over it. And I think I think they you know they thought I was nuts at that at that point. <laughs> I wouldn't blame them for thinking it anyway. Um, you know, we'd be, I'd be watching a, watching TV with my dad, you know, on a weekend, but I'd have that, I'd have this stack of papers and I'd be working on it just, you know, half paying attention to whatever was on the screen. Um, but something did come of it and I, I'm glad it did because I, I did put a, a, a inordinate amount of time into that, that book. Um, and I think it needed it. I think that source material, that transcript is so strange i mean there there are moments in that and in other uh, the apollo 11 the apollo 11 um air to ground uh mission transcript so the communications uh between houston and the astronauts 
this document, which is you can download it online for free. Just Google it. Uh, there's a, a NASA website that still hosts it. It's a PDF. Um, it's a very strange document. It's it's very technical, of course, but there are moments of weirdness in it that I wanted to sort of tease out. And there's tons of, of course, conspiracy theorists uh, uh, theories, I should say, about um, about uh, astronaut communications and you know there's a there's a theory that um that there are uh, uh well it's not really a theory i mean it is it is a it is an actual occurrence they, there's a, a point in one of the um the later mission transcripts i don't know if it's apollo 14 15 16 or 17 where uh the astronauts i believe are on the moon and at one point there's a switch from normal speech to uh coded speech and they start actually using uh, an official form of uh, of code, of code speak. And they start saying like, okay, we've got a, you know, uh, there's some there's some bubble gum on the lens, or like they'll they'll say weird things, like and and it's and but it's but there's a moment when it's actually admitted, like there's an actual moment when Houston says, you know, if you guys are going to describe what you're seeing right now we have to switch to Charlie Echo Bravo or something. And they go, oh, okay. And then they start speaking in code, but it's recorded. So there's a bunch of weird conspiracy theories about these transcripts. So I, when I was writing this, I, of course, wanted to sort of hint at that while also doing everything else I could to, to make those pages into poems. And the, the, the most brutal pages are the ones where there was almost no speech. There are pages where it's, it's, you know, there'll be 30 lines on the page, 20 of them or 25 of them will just be the astronauts reading off numbers, like reading off readings, like they're confirming with Houston that that certain numbers or values are correct. And there, there's almost no actual text. So how do you make a poem out of that, right? It's, 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 a, it's a nightmare. And those pages, I mean, I, on average, I did about 10 uh, iterations of each page. So you can multiply the total number of pages by 10. So that's about 2,500 uh, erasures that I did. And 10% of those actually got into the book at the end of the day. Some pages were two or three versions, but those were few and far between to get to the final version that ended up in the book. Other pages went, I mean, I think the highest one was maybe 15 iterations to get to the one that I was satisfied with. Um, so yeah, that, that book, I don't know if I'll ever do an erasure again after that. It was, it was, it may be the, the, the one erasure that I will be, that I will do <laughs> was, was that document. Uh, I did do another erasure actually of the, um, uh, but not the same kind, uh, of the U S, uh, Senate select committee's report on torture. And that document has so many, um, uh, uh, blacked out sections that I thought, well, the thing to do, of course, with this is to erase all the text and leave the important bits, which are the censored bits, because obviously they're important. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been censored. Of course, part of that part of the torture erasure is in the Concrete and Constraints anthology right. from Pentrap Press. There we are. We can plug that. Yes, please buy that. It's a fantastic anthology, um, as, are, as are all the anthologies that Pentrap puts out. They're extremely well made. So. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. I told you to say that. Yeah, I was I was paid by Anthony to say that. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Uh, I'm, I'm interested actually in talking about Apollo 11 a bit more and all these conspiracy theories because being a, a very objectively minded person, I'm sure you don't believe all the, the stories that are out there. No. Are there any that you are tempted by? The one that tempts me uh, is not a... Uh, common one but it is it does exist it's not uh, I, I want to say that I've created it it's a, it's a something that I've come up with myself but it, it, it's not um, so there there's a of course there's the conspiracy theory that uh, we never went to the moon and it was all fake I don't believe that hmm. and then there's the accepted narrative that we went to the moon and everything we saw was real and as with most things I think that the truth is perhaps somewhere in the middle. And again, I don't believe this, but it's tempting. So the, the theory that I'm tempted by is that, well, yes, we did go to the moon. 
Uh, and again, this is this is verifiable in a multitude of ways. I mean, you can you can shine a laser at the mirror we left on the moon. You can see the tracks from the rovers. You can you can you can see these things with a with a consumer grade telescope. It's not difficult to to verify that the moon landings happened. That's that's fact. But what interests me is the footage because they went about it in a very strange, convoluted way uh, when it was broadcast, the Apollo 11 footage uh, specifically, because you have these, of course, you have very, very uh, crude camera equipment for the, you know, relative to what we have now. So very low resolution image, but then the image was not directly broadcast. It was broadcast to a small television screen, and then that screen was then filmed. Um, and I think there's a logistical reason for that. I think it has something to do with the um, the way that the signal was transmitted, that they couldn't just directly broadcast it to uh, television screens. They had to actually broadcast it to their station, uh, wherever it was in uh, at NASA, and then they had to film that. For There was a logistical reason for it. I don't remember. I, I remember reading about this years ago. But... Uh, uh, that always struck me as strange that they that they didn't directly broadcast it. Um, so that's I think part of the reason that a lot of people are suspicious. Is it's like, well, why didn't they just why did they film it from a TV screen? Like, why is there a second generation copy that's so like low resolution you can barely see what's happening? Um, so I think that fuels a lot of people's suspicions. Uh, but the the interesting conspiracy theory about the footage is that uh, the footage is fake even though we did go to the moon, because what we what the astronauts actually encountered on the moon was deemed to be too shocking to actually broadcast. So the, 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 there was actual footage that was filmed and we saw none of it. And there are, but that's only the case for Apollo 11. The subsequent missions, they knew what to avoid. So they didn't look at those things. And there's a famous event that happened where uh, I believe it was Walter Cronkite was covering uh, it's one of the later missions, 14, 16, 15, 16, or 17. It's one of the later Apollo missions. And this happened on live television, but unfortunately nobody recorded it. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, an event that occurred where Walter Cronkite is uh, commentating upon the live feed from one of the later missions. And the camera that they're using, I think it's the camera on one of the rovers, pans over to... Uh, it's panning across the lunar landscape, and all of a sudden, as it pans into the frame, there's an enormous, perfectly rectangular structure that comes into view. And it's like, it's like, a, it's like a, a perfectly machined uh, structure of some kind. It's this, this is smooth. 2001, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's like, I mean, really, it's, it's, it's after that movie came out. This is the 70s, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very 2001. Um, but this structure comes into view for an instant. And then, uh, again, this is according to people who saw this live, because there's no footage of this. The, the, te the TV, the news, the live feed abruptly cuts off for about a minute. And then it comes back, and here, there's Walter Cronkite saying, oh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we had an interruption to the signal there. We had a, a bit of a, a glitch there. And then, of course, the footage continues as if nothing happened. Um, so again, I mean, it could have, been a, could have been a glitch. It could have been some kind of uh, artifact on the, on the uh, signal or something, but that's a strange occurrence. And then, of course, you have the code speak going on. So I think overall what I'm trying to say is the most tempting conspiracy theory in my opinion about the moon landings is not that they didn't happen and it's not that the footage is all fake it's that it's been um, the footage has been uh, uh, edited just to edit out certain things that are too potentially um, if you get to talk about Space Odyssey 2001 uh, there's a line that Haywood Floyd has where he says there's a grave potential for cultural shock if the right conditioning has not been applied yet. So that, that, that interests me. That, that's a tempting theory to, to, to look into. And I, I definitely mentioned it in the Odyssey several times. Um, and I'm working on a book right now about um, the UFO phenomenon and all the, the subculture surrounding that. Um, that sort yeah, what's the one? Is the, the, 
Black Knight, is it? The Black Knight is one one object. Yes, that's that's a very strange one. They they say it's a, um, a thermal blanket from one of the uh, uh, spacewalks or one of the um, shuttle missions that uh, escaped um, from a, a airlocker or something. And it's it's just a thermal blanket that's crumpled up in a compelling shape that's uh, orbiting the Earth. But it it looks very strange. And there's a there's a there's that famous photo of it where it looks like some kind of uh, some kind of ship, derelict ship or probe or something. Uh, and then there's um, I'm going to mispronounce this, but there's a uh, Uma. What is that object? That that baguette shaped asteroid, Uma Muma or something. It's there's a Hawaiian it's something like that. But I I, I will also I'll it's, get it. It's 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 all O's, U's, and M's and A's, and it's it's a uh, th there's there was speculation that that was some kind of interstellar probe. Um, but then of course, if you look at the geology. Uh, of, of how an object like that would form in an asteroid belt. It, it makes sense that it would have that shape. There's there's several theories about how that that kind of elongated uh, shape could. So, um, yeah, there's lots of lots of weird uh, objects. Just there's there's so it's such a so science science fiction and and uh, and the realities of of science overlap in so many cases. And there's it's such a rich area of opportunity for writing like it's 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 irresistible in some ways which is again why the the project i'm working on right now is is going to touch on on uh, yeah. as many as many of those things as i can as i can manage <laughs> it's a dangerous thing to work on in a way because uh, conspiracy theories no matter how smart you are the more yes. you read about them the more compelling they seem you just oh, of because, course uh, that's because of the fantasy side of it that we're all fantasists to some oh, degree course. We want to get caught up in these things. Oh, it's it's very tempting. It's it's very much like, uh, yeah, you're you're. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good metaphor for it, but really, uh, it's it's just temptation. It's it's the it's the uh, the propensity we all have to desire, not not just to to look for patterns, but to actually desire them, to desire that they exist. Uh, and to create them, to create patterns to look for. We're, 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 we're burying the artifacts that we then dig up. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, you have to be very careful. Um, but I think, I think if, if you're a creative person, if you're an, any kind of artist, you, you have the potential to have uh, a resistance to it because you're so used to your own tendency to fantasize that you, you develop a kind of immunity to it, or at least, a, at least you, you can catch yourself. I want to say, if, if you yeah. start to, to fall too deeply into any of those holes, um, you can you can crawl crawl out of them, hopefully. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, there's there's some very bizarre uh, conspiracy theories. Christian actually linked me a document that uh, I, I've just started going through about uh, something called Project Serpico. And if you want to go down a, a science fiction <laughs> rabbit hole, uh, whoever whoever whatever whoever produced this document or whoever made it. Uh, it is it is some it is some compelling science fiction. It's some some pataphysics. Uh, it's it's a it's a uh, an alien exchange program that took place in the seventies, supposedly, where you have you have uh, Apollo astronauts who switched places with beings from Alpha Centauri. You know, and they so, and some of them this is it was in the seventies and eighties. Some of them chose to stay because of the threat of nuclear war. And of course, that means that there are also some uh, extraterrestrials roaming around Earth, right? Like that's that's the whole. It's a whole narrative about it. There's different presidents that were involved, and it's it's a it's a whole. It's a great piece of science fiction. <laughs> it's it's very whoever you know whatever source created it. It's it's a it's a compelling piece of science fiction. Um, but but th things get ridiculous very quickly when you when you start to go down these types of uh, of avenues, and it's it's. It actually becomes, for me anyway, it becomes easy not to believe any any of this <laughs> because things get ridiculous so quickly. You're like, like right away, <laughs> right away. You, you you also like science fiction a lot. I know this. Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. So so you can probably see that the conspiracy theories have more in common with science fiction than, than with science fact. Oh, they, they are science fiction. I mean, science science is such a force uh, and has been in our culture, particularly since the end of the Second World War, the, the explosion of innovation is, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 
drawn back to Haywood Floyd's line from uh, 2001, where he says the, the cultural shock. I mean, every day something occurs that we should be shocked by. I mean, th there's breakthroughs happening that should shock us. And the only reason they don't is because there's so much information coming at us so quickly, and so much of it is just noise, that it's, uh, you know, and some of this, I think, is by design. It's, it's uh, anything that, uh, that should shock us is often just obscured, and we don't see it, because it's just, it's, it's buried. It's buried in noise. Um, but I think the reason that there's so many myths and conspiracy theories surrounding science is because it's, it's popped up out of nowhere in the last 50 years um, in terms of its, its speed and force, uh, uh, in terms of its cultural impact, it's, it's exponential. I mean, like prior to, prior to you know, 1900 to 1950 was, was shocking enough. You have the invention of flight, you have the automobile, you have, uh, you know, I mean, I, I could go on and on. It's, it's, it's that, that was a shocking enough um, half century. I mean, I, I had a, a, a great uh, grandmother who was born in 1903, and she lived to be 101 years old. So uh, I knew her when I was when I was a kid, and you know she could remember a time she she grew up in Edmonton and lived there her whole life, and she used to describe uh, when she was a little girl, the downtown of Edmonton was like one street, and there was no pavement; it was literally just mud. And, you know, there were no cars yet, right? It was, it was just you know, horses and carriages. And this, this, person, this person lived, uh, lived to be 101. So she lived into the, into the 21st century. So to see everything she saw, I mean, I can't even imagine. <laughs> you, you can't imagine. It'd be, like, it'd be like going to another planet. You know, it, it's yeah. just... And a long time insane. ago, well, 100 years plus ago, the science that was out there was actually quite easy for most people to get some sort of grasp on. Yeah. Like right now, we're talking via Skype <clears throat> through laptops, or, mm -hmm. and I like to think I know more than the average person about how that works. But I don't know much. I, I don't know enough. No. I, could, I couldn't build no. this. <laughs> no, it's I. I, I, myself. I got into to um, PC building when I was younger uh, because I like video games. I know how to assemble a PC, but I have no idea uh, how the the components really work internally. I mean, I, I have no electrician's insight into or, or anything into how any of it works. But just going back to <clears throat> conspiracy theories, I think that's why we, we have all these conspiracies popping up. There's a book by Carl Jung uh, about flying saucers. And it's, it's essentially the, it's, it's sort of a Nietzschean argument that he makes where he talks about the, the um, diminishing or disillusion of, of mass religious belief leaving a vacuum that has to be filled with something and Nietzsche pointed out rightly that politics would fill it he predicted Nazism and uh, communism uh, and that's still occurring nowadays we have people who are, whose religion is political um, and uh, I think the interesting thing about Jung's book is he says well these flying saucers and he doesn't make a judgment about their their nature he just says people are seeing things that's a fact and it's like okay we can stop there when it comes to speculation. And he says, why are they seeing things? And what significance do these sightings have? And he says, well, they're religious. They're religious experiences. Whatever the physical cause is, is irrelevant. What's relevant is how they're interpreted. And they're interpreted in a religious way. And there's another book uh, that makes a similar argument about uh, cases of people claiming to have been abducted. And whether it's sleep paralysis or psychosis or whatever, it, it almost doesn't matter. What matters is how these encounters are interpreted. And there's a similar uh, uh, trend of people having, you know, attributing spiritual significance to these events. So I think when people talk about conspiracies and the, even the temptation to, to believe in them, I think comes from uh, that impulse to, to, uh, to have a, a spiritual experience or to have some kind of um, narrative uh, or, or a supernatural um, uh, structure to to reality. There has to be some dimension of that. We seem to we seem to crave it, no matter what. So, yeah. So this is all uh, 
inspiration for your your next project because you've, you've just done these three big books in three years and now you're already working on something well, i think you have been working on this for a, a while now i have uh, i i i planned to to write it and it's it's in a very very rough state right now um i have a, an outline for it and i'm gradually sort of filling in uh filling in the slots with with poems as i as i come up with um ideas for them and uh oftentimes i'll know what the poem's structure is going to be but i i need to i need to wait for uh well not wait i need to gather materials and and compress them until they until a poem pops out <laughs> um but how, how would you describe this project it's not just ufo conspiracy theories uh no it's it's well the the title of the book the working title anyway is uh, project blue book and it's it's a book uh that essentially the 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 lost cosmonauts and uh the manhattan project they have a historical narrative that's that's um uh chronological and this this book um has a similar kind of structure to it it it's follows the um accounts of uh of uh ufo sightings that go back to um ancient times and it sort of moves into the modern era and then uh like lost cosmonauts does it then starts to after after it passes the present starts to speculate about the future um <clears throat> and it's it's going to involve uh various formal experiments that i'm working on um but it, essentially it is actually it's it's it focuses on on experiences of uh of uh alien encounters but it's not a, a book that's um it's not a uh you know it's not a, a, a confirmation of any of these events is true it's not it's not supposed to be um something that makes a particular claim or statement about the validity or the nature or the cause of any of these events it's it's more so just focuses on how they're interpreted focuses on the fallout of their occurrence and how they've been processed and spat out by western culture rather than their actual objective nature or cause it's the 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 effect focuses on the effect not the cause of uh, of all these these sort of alien uh, encounters and conspiracy theories and whatnot and and you know real events documented military encounters with just strange phenomena and it's it's very x-files book it's 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 probably the most uh probably the most risky and least credible thing i will ever write is this is this book um so well, it has to might, be that might mean it's the best then it it, ha well, it has to be the best because it will be it will be a a, a schlock nightmare <laughs> an embarrassment if it's not very good the opening poem of uh, of this book is going to be uh the great silence that's that's the opener uh, that's the first poem in the book and it might be the best thing i've written i don't know if i'll be able to top uh that poem there's there's a poem in lost cosmonauts that's very good uh fragment i think that that and uh the great silence are the two best things i've written and it's distressing to admit that uh it's not it doesn't stroke my ego it's not fun to admit that because in admitting that i'm saying now i have to try to outdo those two poems <laughs> which is yeah which is a which is a distressing challenge because uh they they did not um come about from a great deal of planning like a lot of other poems do they didn't come out they didn't come out of a a a, a preconceived structure they came out of nowhere which is even more distressing because the best if the two best poems came out of the ether um and uh, you know the claims that artists make that they're conduits for some kind of um some kind of their you know their their receivers for some kind of signal of inspiration uh it's it's not something that i like to it's not an idea that i like to promote but there are i think there are moments of that i think people get obsessed with that idea of like yeah you know, 
I'm channeling the cosmic times... energy. Like, <laughs> but but there, are times like I... for, there are times for whatever reason, for unknown reasons, things just click. And yes, that could there... just be chance. Yeah, I, th I think there are moments of it. And that's why they're so tempting to, to focus on, because they, they stand out. But yeah, I, I don't think that's, again, it's, it's the, old, uh, the old meme, I guess you could say, of artists waiting for inspiration rather than going after it. You have to go after it or you'll, yeah. never, you'll never get anything done. Um, you, have, you, you have to be pragmatic or you, know, you, you can't avoid it. It's, it's, it's unavoidable if you want to actually, if you want to write a single poem, you have to do it. I mean, you can't, you can't avoid it. Um, but yeah, those two, those two poems, I mean, the, going back to, to the next book, uh, that's, that's what I'm working on now. It's, it's a slow process because I have a lot to sort through. I have a lot of, um, research for this. I have a lot more documents to go through <clears throat> than I did for, um, Manhattan Project. There's a lot of material that's recently been declassified, uh, and posted online, um, there's the, of course, the recent news about uh, the Nimitz encounters and the Tic Tac uh, UFO has caused a, a, a stir in in various communities and even, you know, it's, I mean, the, the disclosure of this information is, is fairly significant. I mean, the, the U.S. government, for whatever reason, uh, has, has officially admitted that UFOs exist. They're not, and that there's never been an official statement on them of this magnitude in the past they've admitted that they exist and that they don't know what they are and again you know the, the truth of those admissions notwithstanding the act of admitting is interesting and also the uh the admission that um materials from craft have been recovered and studied that don't appear to be from earth i mean these admissions happened publicly in the main in mainstream media but how many people know that they've occurred? Almost nobody. Or if they do, they shrug their shoulders. And maybe that's the conditioning working then. Maybe, maybe then if, if, we're, if we're not shocked by that, hell, like <laughs> open up the hangers and, you know, start, start selling tickets, start getting people into tour, you know, start getting people touring. You know, clearly we're not shocked by this. <laughs> <laughs> clearly the conditioning's worked by now, I think. <laughs> but so this, but uh, what, what a headache for you this is that you've got that you're writing this book and you think you yeah. could have days where you think I finished this book and then there's something else in the news and you've got oh it, it, I've got to write it, about that it, now it diminishes well it, it it is a challenge for sure and it it adds it's it's added uh, poems I've had to wedge them into the outline right and but also it diminishes the mystery that's the worst impact it has is it diminishes the the uh, speculation about the nature of these phenomena and these events um, which is what fuels the poems it's what gives them energy and makes them interesting um so it, it's it's distressing because if they, if they do open up the hangers fling the doors open and and show the specimens and and you know bob bob lazar they hire him to like a you know yeah <laughs> i just had this this absurd thought of him in like a there's like an area 51 disneyland and bob lazar's in a, a gray alien costume like mickey mouse or something that'd be i feel like that's that'd be his idea of hell um but they, if, if they do, you know, figuratively speaking, fling open the doors and, and just, you know, say, well, here's, the, here's what you wanted to see. We have no idea what any of this is. We've been studying it for 60, 70 years, and we're no closer to knowing <laughs> anything about it than we did uh, when we found it. Uh, you know, that would be a disaster <laughs> for this book. I, I don't think I would publish the book. I think I'd stop working on it. I think I'd say, well, I got, uh, I got great silence. And that's... That's the only piece of that book that's ever gonna <laughs> gonna float around in public. But uh, yeah, that that would be a nightmare for me <laughs> if that happened. It would I mean all the work I've done so far would be I'd have to throw it out, or I'd have to I'd have to radically alter the um, the structure of the book uh, and treat the material in a completely different way. Maybe that would be a good thing, um, because again, the, the struggle with these putting out these books is to make them uh, distinct. If if they're too similar to one another. Uh, it's not good, but at the same time, really, they're all part of one project. Uh, they're they're all volumes of of a kind of project uh, that that's I've had planned out for several years. So there there does I mean there there is a certain consistency to them, and I think it's it works in their favor when it's done right. Um, but again, I, yeah, I don't want to publish the same book three times. That would be 
uh, better to not publish anything than to publish the same thing over and over again. But again, I, I do consider them to be volumes. Uh, I think if you were to take Lost Cosmonauts and uh, maybe not the Odyssey, maybe the Odyssey's on its own, but if you were to take that and Manhattan Project and, and this book I'm working on now and publish them as one big book with different sections, of course, uh, I think that would work. That's that's the idea anyway, is, is that it would, they're all kind of volumes in the same project. And then I have some ideas for what to write after uh, my current project, but I'm not as invested in those ideas. I, I have an idea, uh, I have two, two ideas for books that, that could follow this one. But um, I'm, I'm less and less inclined to pursue them as time goes by because I have other projects I'm interested in working on as well. And there's only so much time. <laughs> there's only so much time in the, in the day. And I, you know, doing this, doing this PhD, I put a lot of things on hold. This, this uh, global apocalypse has not helped, but I've, I've, uh, I've had to put my small press on hold, which I, I hate doing, but I, I haven't had the mental energy or the time to devote to properly producing things. Um, for months, it's a, and I, it's, you know, poets can poets complain when they don't have enough ideas, but it's also sometimes true that you've, you've got too many things, you've got oh, too many things sure. going on, too and, many creative and I, projects, and and I, I hate to complain about that. I'm I'm probably making people angry just by saying this, but it it is it is a a pain when you have more more ideas than you have time or resources, uh, because they it's it's like having a warehouse full of. Uh, ripe fruit and it, it's just rotting before your eyes. I mean, it's it's a it's a kind of hell to just to sit there and and watch it, like to sit there and watch it rot and have to be like, well, I can save, so, you know, I can save two crates of this fruit out of a thousand, and the rest are going to rot, or I can I can try to save them, but you know, eventually they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna rot. Um, I can write things down, I can save notes and ideas, but if they never get made, they might as well just cease to exist. So it's it's a different kind of um, different kind of of unique hell, and all writers have their own uh, all artists really have their own uh, their own kind of artistic hell. Something that they constantly it's a constant annoyance. You know? It's always something. There's always some kind of a a challenge. But well, if we didn't have that. Let's not end on a downer, which which, no, no, which no. cheer people up during the pandemic. No, 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 no. I'm 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 just saying it, it's. I, I was about to I was about to to bring things back up. I, I was saying, uh, if you if you don't have something like that, you won't produce good art. You know, art from adversity. But anyway, um, yeah. Just just this this last few months, uh, trying to do this PhD in the midst of all that's been going on has been, uh, has been rough. And I've, I've kind of uh, we were talking about this earlier. I think before before we started the interview, but I, I've, uh, I've, I've kind of just retreated, I think, in, in reaction to everything that's gone on, um, which has been its own kind of frustration because uh, it's important to have something to do. If, you don't, if you're not doing something, uh, you know, depression or anxiety will come in to fill that void and to occupy your time if nothing else is occupying it. So it's, oh, it's yeah, been... My, my, my year has been... Either working completely obsessively yeah. or doing nothing. Yeah, that's that's that's, yeah. that's a good way of summing it up. I, I've that's yeah, I think that's. But anyway, um, now that uh, I'm I'm I've uh, passed these institutional obligations I have for my PhD, uh, and and really the the rest of this degree is going to be just thesis work. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I don't like taking tests. That's part of the reason I'm in the field I'm in. Uh, and now that the now that uh, the examinations are done, I'm really looking forward to writing this thesis. Um, and it's it's something that I've wanted to write now for years, and and I, I finally have the chance to do it. So that's exciting. And I think I think this, as this year comes to a close, a lot of people will be eager to move forward and basically pretend that the last eight or nine months never happened. <laughs> so hopefully we can all do that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Well, it's, it's been really good talking to you, and, and I haven't seen you in a while because you've been so busy and because of everything that's been going on. Uh, before you go, though, I would I would like you to read what you, what you yourself called your best poem. Sure. Uh, let me so just uh, a great silence. Let me just bring up a uh, copy of it here. I foolishly didn't already have it up here. Uh, Pour a glass of wine and enjoy this. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay. The great silence. For all the species we will never meet. The last living Kawaii-o-o bird, ignorant of extinction, sang until death for a mate. The dirge of the plain-feathered honey-eater shone in vivid isolation, burning in the blank face of space. The creature reached with what frenzy of notes its throat allowed, pausing only to listen for a far-off reply. The staccato echoes of the bird persist in sound files lodged in the hard drives of archival servers. The notes of this final song, black dashes on a grainy graph of background noise, find eyes powerless to revise time. But still they reach with the feverish immediacy of hope for some absent companion, for an answer from the dead. Across the gulfs of time, who knows what singers sing, like lucid dreamers banished from the realms of one another's sleep, like ghosts whose limbos of unliving cannot intersect, like genies imprisoned in unfound lamps scattered across the treasures of lost tombs, like microbes frozen in separate asteroids whose disparate orbits write for each of them a unique doom, like entangled particles estranged by the body of the universe, like astronauts caught in the fly traps of event horizons staring into dewdrops of black quartz, like stranded mammals gazing into the sinews of distant nebulae drunk on the wonder of fleeting humility. How can we survive if we remain addicted to exploring the limits of our suffering? With every song we fail to hear, we lose a better version of ourselves that series of unfamiliar notes might coax from us. The fire that prevents starvation depends on the friction that births it. Indifferent masons chisel our constituent matter the inanimate manna of the stars dwindles as entropy racks energy. Each singularity invites us to unlock it, like rusted gates beckon a lonely manor dweller to inspect her keys. Eventually, each species must curate its end. It's a fantastic poem. Thank and you. it's been so good catching up. I <clears throat> will invite you back on the podcast when things are normal again or I'd, I'd be happy to come back anytime and, and we should anytime. chat uh we should chat again as well just uh just casually i'd, I'd really like that to discover more visit us at pentrackpress.com